talking about just kind of the big picture as far as firearms of the uh, historical firearms. I don't want to insult anyone's intelligence. I know a lot of you know what a rifle is and a smoothbore is, but for those who may not be as clear on that, we'll cover a little bit about that. <clears throat> so let's start out there. A rifled gun. Actually, I'm going to start out with a smoothbore. Uh, I'm going to do this one. Oh, I just want to be able to. So it, today we'd call this a shotgun, but back then they'd have called it a smoothbore. And basically what it means is the barrel is smooth inside. It's as smooth on the inside as it is on the outside. And uh, when they first invented guns years and years ago, that's what they invented were smoothbores. Now the nice thing about a smoothbore is you can put a lead ball down in there or you can put shot. Shot's going to be a little tiny, what we'd call BBs now. There's different sizes of them, but you can put that down in there as well. Um, you could you could even do both. You could put a ball and some BBs down in there. They call it buck and ball, and uh, and then you'd be ready for anything. So if a elk walks up, you're ready for him. If a goose walks up, you're ready for him. So that's one of the nice things about a smooth bore. <clears throat> However, smooth bores because uh, um, they're smooth in the in the uh, actually in Germany is where they kind of started to figure out that if they could get a twist on that ball it would be more accurate so the way that they did a twist on that was they if you look down in the barrel of there you can see that it's not smooth anymore it's got what's called rifling so it's called a rifle and if you could somehow look at all those rifling you'd see that they actually twist as they go down the barrel. So when that ball comes out, it's gonna have a twist to it, just like a quarterback throwing a spiral football. And it's gonna get more accuracy. So you're, you're gonna get twice or sometimes even three times the accuracy that a smooth bore will get. So <clears throat> once the Germans invented those rifles, then um, this was back before, about the time of, you know, shortly after Columbus and as the, as the uh, American colonies were being created is kind of when the Germans were perfecting those those rifles. So by the time of the early 1700s you'd have seen rifles starting to come over here and especially German gun builders. They, they came to places like Pennsylvania. They uh, would have been bringing that rifling technology with them and uh, so they started to become pretty highly sought after. But still there were there were thousands and th hundreds hundreds of thousands of smooth bores that were uh, that were around as well in other words once once the rifle technology came it certainly didn't make the smooth bores obsolete by any means they were still very practical so that's the difference between a rifle and a smooth bore <clears throat> i mentioned the german gunsmiths this would have been something that would be similar to what they would have been building in the colonial period george washington's time um, and uh, slightly before that. This would go from about 1750 to around 1790 is this, this is the kind of gun that had been building. So that's quite often called a, a Pennsylvania rifle or you'll often hear it called a Kentucky rifle. Most of the Kentucky rifles weren't actually built in Kentucky. They were built um, farther east in place, you know, places like Pennsylvania or South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, places like that. You'll hear them called Virginia rifles. Later on, they got built in Kentucky, but that was actually into the late eight, or later 1800s. So, anyway, um, but they got named Kentucky Rifle um, because they were used a lot in the Kentucky and Tennessee frontier and on the Ohio frontier. And uh, and in fact, they became so popular that by the Mountain Man era, by the 1830s, there was a song about Kentuckians that fought in the War of 1812, the Battle of um, New Orleans uh, that kind of made the Kentucky Rifles famous and uh, later on Scott Walker will be presenting a little presentation actually about that song and the hunters that, that uh, how popular those were amongst the mountain men. So anyway, as the fur companies, when Lewis and Clark came out, they had they had rifles that were built at the at the Harper's Ferry um, Armory because they were a military expedition. 
um, the young United States uh, had a little armory there in Harper's Ferry and created all the guns that uh, Lewis and Clark brought with them. So they were a military firearm. As soon as Lewis and Clark got back, then you saw fur companies start to head up the Missouri River. Okay, Manuel Lisa and uh, Andrew Henry and guys like that started to bring expeditions up the Missouri River to start to trap this um, important uh, area for beaver, right? And uh, so some of the early trappers would have maybe even had some army surplus, um, some Lewis and Clark guns. A lot of them initially would have brought their own guns. They might, you know, if they had a Kentucky rifle, they might bring that with them. If they had a smooth bore, they might bring that with them. Um, there was kind of a pause in the fur trade because of the War of 1812, which I won't go into a lot. But, but then in the 1820s, things started back up. But by the 1820s, they'd kind of figured out a different system. Uh, it's important to know that they, they realized that uh, east of the Mississippi River, they had pretty well been able to trade for most of their furs from the Indians. But when they got west of the Mississippi River, that wasn't working so well. So that's when they started hiring white trappers um, in the 1820s, basically, to start coming out west. Um, and there's various reasons for that, but I won't go into that because, again, we'll stick with firearms. But basically, so companies started to form, and some of them had already been in existence for a long time, like Hudson's Bay Company and Northwest Company. But anyway, they started to form to come out and... and um, get this resource in the West. And those companies would a lot of time provide their trappers with a gun. Um, now, uh, when you became a trapper, if you were a young man, say Jim Bridger in 1823, coming West with Ashley and, uh, and Henry's outfit, um, you would have, they would have a ledger. These companies would have a ledger and you would go in and when you got hired for them, then, um, you basically bought on credit all the materials that you were going to need. So they would say, Dave's back there, I'll say, here's Dave's name on the, on the ledger, and he got one gun, and he got a blanket, and he got six traps, and he got etc., etc. This is the stuff that Dave got. And the first year that he's working, he's got to pay off most of that stuff. Now, different companies varied. Sometimes they would just throw in stuff. Sometimes they would give you stuff. But generally speaking, there were those ledgers that uh, you, they kept track of what you got and then you had to pay that back. And uh, sometimes it might take you a whole year to pay back, you know, your, your first supplies. Of course, you'd have your gun after that. Um, but as you trapped beaver, you would start paying off your account, more or less. That's important to know because if you had a rifle, uh, Let's see, Moki, let me have you grab your sure. rifle for sure. a second. Good morning. If you, if, if you, uh, in the ledger, if in the books you got a rifle, that meant you owed the company a lot more than if you got a smooth bore. A rifle would be about 10, 10 bucks at that time, okay, which sounds really cheap to us, but um, uh, it was actually quite expensive, where a trade gun would be about half that price. In the neighborhood of four or five bucks. So um, anyway, so a lot of a lot of trappers would a lot of them would be carrying a smooth bore, a lot of them be be carrying a rifle. Some of it would depend on how how deeply into debt they wanted to go. Some of it would depend on uh, what they felt most comfortable with. Um, and then of course a lot of the guns that were out here were brought out by the companies to trade with Indians specifically. And uh, the majority of those were smooth bores, um, but they brought out rifles for, for Indian trade as well. And in fact, oh. he's, that gun he's holding, he'll tell you about it. So, um, do you want to go from there? Sure. So, some of the things they brought, most of the time, and the thinking that they had with uh, trade with the Indians, they mostly traded smooth bores with them. There's a double reason for that. It was a needed gun that they could use, they could hunt with it and hunt big game animals but it was a limited range if they were used in warfare against each other. A rifle such as this or a Ketlin or any of the other rifles would have an effective range of maybe 150 to 200 yards if you're shooting 
uh, in combat with another person or an Indian or somebody like that. And if you're shooting with a smooth bore, you're pretty much limited to an effective range of maybe 70 yards. You could lob shells in on them because they're smooth and they're not going to have that kind of an accuracy that a rifle would. So trading rifles to an Indian were pretty much almost kept mostly for like chief grade guns. This is this gun here that I'm holding is a replica of one that's in the Museum of the Fur Trade in Chadron, Nebraska. This gun is actually a copy of that including all the scroll work and the way all the pins are. It's a 62 caliber rifle and it was called a Tyrone Indian trade gun but it was mostly a trade gun for the chiefs. That's what they would have used it for because it's rifled again thereby giving it a longer range. 62 caliber was quite large but then on these smooth bores they'd be 62 caliber commonly and you'd shoot like you said ball or some shot for small game. Uh, some of the men that came out had rifle guns that they, if they didn't get it from the company, they had their own guns. They would have guns that were made by the gun makers of the time period and just before, like some originals. We have some originals here in this group. I'm gonna talk about one and I'm gonna ask my friend who owns it. This rifle here is a Ketlin, right? My friend uh, Badger, this is an original. So this gun here was made where? It's made in London, England. Made in London, England. Uh, Thomas Ketlin was the founder of the Ketlin and Company. Started exporting to the United States in around 1790. Was one of the biggest exporters of trade guns to uh, to America for the fur trade. He died in about uh, 1819, I believe, and his son William took over. This is a William Ketlin. William Ketlin made guns for the fur trade from. Uh, around 1818 to 1834 before they went bankrupt. And they were actually the most sought after guns by Americans for their quality. Yeah. So here in front of you, you see some originals, just like uh, Badger was talking about. And this is, like I said, quality weaponry coming from London. I'm gonna pick up a couple other originals and uh, uh, the history on some of them I can explain with uh, the help of Badger. Some of them, the gentlemen that owns us are behind us, like Doc and uh, and uh, Richard. Now this is an original also. It's been converted. This is a little later in the period, but this is an original pistol. It's a, uh, do you know? Okay, I, I, I almost wanna say Derringer, but this is an actual pistol, and you can see by the fine workmanship on it, and it was converted from a flintlock to a percussion, which is a little later, but it's still fur trade period. And mountain men would have had, if they could afford it, they'd have a rifle and a pistol, because there you have two shots. You know, in the time period, just if, for the folks that watched the movie last night, you know, a Native American, if they were in combat and shooting at you with arrows, they could lose six arrows at you quicker than you could uh, shoot that one shot and reload. So a pistol was a close quarters weapon and it would be something that would be almost at the last resort. And uh, this is a fine example of an original, very finely made, very beautiful. Uh, here's another original pistol. It's got a brass barrel, flintlock again. And uh, who made this? That's a Wilbraham. Wilbraham. He made uh, trade pistols for the American trade from 1825 to 1834. Yeah. So here it is, and it's a smooth bore, it's a brass barrel, and this is an original. So you see how well this has kept up through the years. And you know, they, they, they would use this again for protection, but you could actually be in a smooth bore, you could load this with shot, you know, a little bit of shot and use it for clothes, for rabbits and things to eat, you know. You could use it for hunting. Uh, all these guns could be used for hunting and defense. But a smooth bore had a versatility, you know, like Tim was talking about where you could use it for big game and for uh, foul. Uh, I believe this belongs to uh, Doc Ivory. I'm not sure, but I believe it is. And this is a original again. And it's a double barreled, uh, double barreled shotgun. And they did bring shotguns out there uh, and mostly using it, you know, for guarding the horses, personal protection, but you know, around the camp, when they're doing a brigade and they're moving out to rendezvous or coming back from rendezvous, 
you know, a personal man, this was a lot of money and it was also heavier, but this is something that they would have used and they definitely had shotguns for the horse guards, you know, and the horse guards would be at night as you're moving and trapping, you'd have your horses picketed or in an area where you could watch them and they'd actually have round the clock guards because if you didn't watch your horses, they'd get stolen. And then a man afoot in the mountains is gonna be a dead man eventually. So they'd have guys with shotguns watching their horses and they'd be loaded up with shot, actually, to protect themselves also from the other things beside, you know, losing it to Indians and horses getting away. They also had problems with bears. So a shotgun could be loaded with, you know, maybe some heavy ball and some shot. So this is another original, beautiful, beautiful gun. The Indians, like I said, mostly had smoothbore guns and they were traded smoothbore guns at the forts with Hudson Bay and at a, you know, with the traders. And mostly what they were using is what we see here, which are basically all smoothbore and they're all flintlock. Now this one here is also, used to be a trade gun and they cut it down they used to have different names for the guns. Something like this was cut down to be more concealable and easier to carry. You could have a, like this has, a hole in it for a loop to carry on your body or carry on your horse. But you could, they used to call these blanket guns. And blanket guns were specifically for a close-in weapon, like a little shotgun, you know. So this is similar to these other trade guns, but it has the barrel cut off and it's shorter. Some places a little longer and then where they have water, they used to have these, they used to call these things canoe guns. They're say, basically the same trade gun, just cut short enough to be used within the confines of a canoe or a dugout or a keel boat. Yeah. There's a typical tank. Yeah. So that, that's, you know, a quick thing. The Native Americans, you would use these guns and in the fights with the trappers and stuff like in 1836, you know, they had mostly, I, I believe, smooth bores fighting against the trappers who had rifles. Now the trappers carried smooth bores also because they're a versatile gun and they're also cheaper. But if you were gonna wither in the mountains and as you stayed longer in the mountains, I believe they all upgraded to a rifle because a rifle gives you a longer range for protection, longer range for hunting. And of course, it just gave you a little bit more versatility. They're actually, versatility is what the smooth bore was, but the rifle was much better for protection and hunting. Just like nowadays, you know, the longer you've been at, at, at work, the, you get a little bit more money. So, as I mentioned, initially when you came out with the company, then, you know, you would have got stuff that the company had. But as you lived out here, again, somebody like a Jim Bridger or a Jedediah Smith or someone like that, as they kind of either moved up in the company or eventually some of them became free trappers, um, then a lot of times they would, you know, they'd get a little bit nicer rifle or they'd get a, uh, you know, all kinds of nicer gear. <clears throat> While I've got this one in my hand, something that Badger mentioned that I thought would be good for you. He told you that both of his originals were made in England. And uh, there were tons and tons of firearms that were coming from Europe. This happens to be a French, a French piece. But there were tons of them coming, there were Dutch guns, there were a lot of English guns, there were a lot of French guns that were that were coming out. And then as you got later along in the fur trade period, there became, you know, more and more American makers as well of the firearms. Let's talk just a little bit for a minute about um, how these are loaded. Monkey mentioned to you that these are all flint locks. Uh, while, we're, while I'm thinking about it, um, during the fur trade 1820 to 1840, you'd have seen mostly flintlocks, especially early on. Now, percussion, uh, we don't have, well, yeah, that we one pistol's pistol. percussion. The difference between a flintlock and a percussion is that flint, if you, if you can see here, this has a little rock in it. That's the flint. That's going to come down and strike what's called the frizzen, and that's going to throw some sparks. That's what, what's going to ignite your load, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a second. So this is a flintlock. This is a percussion. You'll notice that it's a little bit different. Is this one, Richard? Yes. Um, it's got a little bit different mechanism there. It doesn't have the rock in it anymore. It doesn't have that flint. It's got what's called a nipple right there, and then a cap will go on that nipple. So 
the percussion uh, technology came about um, really during the early 1800s, about the same time that the fur trade was getting was out here. Um, by about 1830-ish approximately, uh, you were starting to see percussions out here as well. Um, and some guys liked them and some guys didn't. Uh, um, just like any new technology. So I'm sure some of you, I, some of you are on your phone all the time and some of you wouldn't have a smartphone if your life depended on it. So. Yeah. But, the, but the, tell them about the inconvenience or the advantages? Yeah, yeah. so the advantages of having a flintlock is um, as long as you can get flints, and there were places even around the west that you could get flints, then you always had that technology your gun would work. If you had a percussion, you had to have those caps, and those were manufactured back east. There wasn't any place you could get manufactured caps out here. You had to either at rendezvous or from a fort, you had to get those caps. So if you ran out of caps, you just ran out of gun. So that's part of the reason that some, some guys stuck with a flintlock rather than going over to the percussion. In a, in a typical day, how, what condition would they carry those in? Let's say they're not in a battle, not in a battle. They keep those prime. Yeah, they'd, uh, so they'd, they'd keep them, yep, they'd keep them.